right here is made in USA. Not no China, not no Taiwan, not no Singapore, USA. Welcome back to the Tacoma Beast channel where it's all about the taco. With me today is Greg. He's the owner and founder of Fab Force and today we're going to be doing a facility tour. How's it going, man? Pretty good. You ready for Come the Come on in. So first off, you notice we're off the beaten path. Yes. We actually don't sell direct to customers or even shops. It's mostly through distribution. So nobody gets lost and stumbles out here. That's why the outside, not so fancy. But inside, it's world headquarters. So you see just kind of in the waiting room, some of the prior accolades, cool builds that we've had in the past. And then we've got kind of this wall of pride from all of our fastest growing company in Charlotte. We actually made the Inc. 500 and the Inc. 5000. So some crazy growth through our history. In fact, I consider that part of our, that's what we do is grow. We just happen to be a bumper company. So right here, we're gonna make a split. First, we're gonna go to operations and finance. So uh, basically you've got, you know, HR, CFO, plant management, and just all the functions that are gonna be happening for the front office that take care of the plant itself. You know, when we bought this building, it was an old textile factory, 146,000 square feet. And this whole front was super old school, 70s looking and brown. We totally refurbished it. You know, even though we don't have walk-ins or actual truck owners coming here, but just for the employees and the sense of pride that we are the world's leading bumper manufacturer, so we should live like it. A little shot of the trophy room through there. So it's got old toys that we were on, the original Legend RC car, just some cool memorabilia over the past, some of the patents that we have, just fun stuff. Call it the trophy room. It's where most of our front office meetings are. Got our little marketing department, whole bunch of activities these guys got brewing. It's been a little off at the beginning of the year due to the show schedules, totally getting kiboshed due to COVID, but still have a big online presence, a lot of content to build, a lot of trucks to work through. And this is the engineering department. So I'll interrupt their meeting for a second. We do all our 3D model reviews and things here on the big screen, just kind of going through the CAD, uh, double checking things at every one of the stage gates, just to make sure we get the designs right. And for the moment, I actually have an office. I didn't for about five years, but I took one over down in the corner, just makes a, a better spot to go sit. So now we go out to where the real magic happens in the plant. So building one, it's really three roofs of 46,000 square feet. This is kind of the playground. It's all about new product development and marketing up here. So we've got two of the two post lifts. We buy all the trucks that we need to support engineering and we will build prototypes right here if we need to. It's got all the things kind of in a mock fabrication cell that we would have out on the plant floor. That way we're kind of self-contained as far as making quick changes. If we have to cut something, weld something up, make a little side bracket and just fire through those test fits. You know, we gotta make sure, like not only is the aesthetics just right and we've complemented all the lines of the truck, but man, I grew up building trucks myself and you get super frustrated when you can't get your hand in there, you can only get one click on the ratchet, all those things about making the installation easier. Whether it's being done in your driveway or at a shop, we wanna make sure that a Fab Four is bolts on just like it should, with all the parts, nothing's missing, good craftsmanship, good powder, and the perfect lines. So to do that, you gotta pay to play. We've got all the right toys. We've got the trucks, we've got the equipment, we've got the engineering team. And be able to control all that in-house from a crazy sketch I might make at 30,000 feet with a cocktail on a plane crossing the country to building a prototype, we can knock that out basically in a day and a half. And then we can go and run 80 of them the next day. Having all that in-house is what it really allows us to keep refining a product in its totality. We've got our own in-house studio, something important because our products are black. You know, that people ask what color can I get that? The answer is black or black because we've got flat black and shiny black. That's it. Well, a black product doesn't necessarily show you all the intricate details and a simple picture out in a parking lot. When we use the studio, we can take, if we got the camera on a tripod, multiple shots of the same product, lighting different faces, combine those into one. So on the website, you're really getting to see 
as close as you can to being there in person, all the attributes of the product before you make that buying decision. So we got some of the fun trucks in here. You know, again, it's the fleet. We had some of these prepped to go through the show schedule, even though that got yanked out from under us. Uh, this truck right now is kind of in commuting size, but it was actually intended and was running on 44 inch boggers on 24 inch wheels and just looks ridiculous. But isn't really functional, so it's kind of a waste of a Platinum Super Duty. So we threw it on some Chimera 40s for the time being. Our Gladiator, the first Overland build we did, which was kind of the spawning of the Tacoma that could kind of compete with this one. And then some of our wheel and tire inventory that's really there to supplement our open fender systems on the HDs. So we make 40s that, or wheels that fit Jeeps, but mostly it's about the HDs. A couple of old dilapidated builds. I mean, these things are crazy. This Ranger has been through seven iterations since it was one of the first JKs back in 07. And you've got Chimera, which was our centerpiece in 2015 at SEMA. Just an over the top, chop top Chevy Colorado with MRAP axles and a rear engine, 12 valve, twin turbo Cummins, just insane. So that's building one. This is where all the vendors and customers like to come because it's where all the fun toys are, unless you geek out for manufacturing. And that's one of the cool things about Fab Fours. This is legitimate, 100% in-house. So we're going from sheet metal up front all the way to a packaged bumper out the back to, to leave this place. Truckloads of steel can hold, I think it's 60,000 pounds, and we get at least two of those a week. It's pretty crazy the amount of processing going through here. So I'll take you and show you what's up. I prefer starting my tour with the life of the steel up by the lasers, but when you come through here, and it will make sense for the flow, but this is our tube department. Super proud of this. Tube is an extremely hard thing to manufacture. If you go to a tube house or if you outsource bent tube, they're gonna want you to run at least 100. The reason for that, you gotta dial in the machine. Just like normal steel, a tube has its own grain, it's got a little bit different wall thickness, and all the bending is done off of pressures. You know, they don't have that sophisticated of a sensor to say, I'm at 87 degrees. It's bent off pressure and stops and releases. Well, we don't manufacture that way. We're not gonna run 100. We're gonna run as many as we need that were sold. So we've had to become lethally efficient. Hey, this is good luck. But sometimes it's rare to catch a full guard being bent, but it's by far the coolest. I should have these on. So this is some two and a half inch, 120 wall tubing and just watch this sucker flow. So the two Alpine 80 HDs, these are the big dogs. This is what we got to use on the 120 wall, two inch and two and a half. And we also bend inch and a half and inch and three quarter on the smaller Socos. Wow, extremely rare. We got two going at once. That's so it's really cool, the little precision that you're gonna get out of these. And you don't necessarily recognize all the steps that go into two. We have to cut it to length, then bend it in the mandrel CNC bender. Then we're gonna miter it on the tilt head saw. Then we gotta go cope it to make the tube to tube cope. And then we polish every single tube. That's the level of quality you're gonna get at Fab Fours where even some of the die marks that might come in striations through that or even from the mill, we're gonna polish every last one of those out before it goes on the bumper. Our older, smaller Socos struggle with the big tube because of that clamping force required to just yank this piece of 120 wall. Watch it fly up. It, it takes a lot of stress on that clamping force. Whoop, that's sweet. Yeah, so try doing that at home on the old Model 3. That's how we started, baby. Just like you have a JD squared, sucker sitting on the ground, one pull at a time. I'm nah, just kidding, we had at least electric or hydraulic, but still, basically that style where you've got the dial indicator. Yeah, so that's our tube shop. You're gonna end up with that, that flat piece, all the cut to lengths, get them bent, 
using a, a myriad of fixtures and these tilt head saws. That's what allows us to have fewer fixtures where they can do multiple bumpers on the same one because you have the ability to say, hey, set the miter at 27.5 degrees. Whoop, head tilts over, cut it. Then we gotta cope it and then we polish it. And the final result, an awesome piece of tube. Completely polished, no tool marks, perfectly set up. So again, this looks simple and small, but this had to be cut to length, bent in the middle, mitered on this end, mitered on this end, and then coped here, and then polished. A lot of steps just to get a side tube right. But that's the right way to do it. Now we'll go back to the front of the building and we'll see how we start out with our typical 11 gauge, 3 16 quarter, some 16 gauge for decorative parts and fire pits. And we will actually cut half inch, 3 eighths, and 3 quarters as required. All right, so this is the money shot of the factory. This is basically how you enter the door as a piece of flat sheet metal and get morphed into the world's leading bumper. So first things first, you gotta pick it up with the suction, load it on the two 6,000 watt lasers. These have multiple beds so we can swap under. Now let me show you the cut. It's pretty amazing at that level wattage for the different thicknesses we have, just how fast these things cut. And they leave a perfect, no draw side. We have basically zero prep we have to do before going into assembly. The best thing is just the time of cut. So take a peek through the window, you can see it's just ripping around. Our goal is to have this thing cutting all day. So it's just as big a task to actually sort all of these parts after they come off the laser as it is managing any other piece in the, the plant. Quite frankly, this would probably intimidate me the most because each one of these is just a random, you know, origami, it's just a shape in there. And you have to be able to discern what that is and parse it out to the cart so it'll become a bumper. This could have four bumpers worth of different parts on it that share this material thickness. That's the way the nest works where it's taking the day's production and just trying to optimize what's gonna go on each sheet so we get as much utilization as possible. But that means you end up with scattered bumper parts throughout the different thicknesses that then have to migrate and get with all their like-minded parts that can become a bumper. So here's a kind of a bird's eye view as you watch the laser actually operating. So it's tracking that on the monitor. And again, you can see the speed. So what's the cut time for this whole sheet? 12.45. 12 minutes, basically, to rip that whole sheet of, is this, is this 11 gauge? Or 316, yes, 11, gauge. 11 gauge. That's how it starts. So as soon as that's done, it will automatically swap that bed. And that starts the timer. Basically, you've got 12 minutes to get all those parts off into their carts. So you can see what they've done here. They've basically yanked them all out of there, thrown the skeletons away, and they gotta load the next sheet all in time before that thing finishes cutting. And from here, that's where you're gonna go and farm these out to the carts and make them get with the bumper pieces that they need. So every one of these carts is representing a product going through. It's got a work traveler telling you all the different pieces and components, which is how you would actually do that if you weren't a veteran. Uh, every one of the cut programs has individual part numbers, so you could match them to a traveler on your first day. But these guys, they're savants, man. They've learned all of the SKUs to be able to knock it out. Oh, this is pretty cool. All right, come over here. So after cutting, you're into forming. Now these are state-of-the-art, seven axis back gauge, quick change tools with LEDs. And you can see how quickly the back gauges are just ripping along to the next bend. He's checking it in case he has to make any bend corrections. But once you've done that, it's just bang, bang, bang. The fingers are moving. Now if you go to some old school manufacturing, that's part of why they're gonna run a, want to run 500 parts at a time, because a real press break in, back in the day, you would physically bolt the back gauges to a fixed spot, exactly where it should be, and then you would bolt in 
the top and bottom dies. Well, once you've done all that work for a half an hour, 45 minutes, you wanna just bend and bend and bend the same bend. We don't have that. Because of the complexity of our parts and the rapid flow and the single piece flow and the lean manufacturing, he's gotta be able to just rip through this and then move right onto the next bumper, the next part. Pretty awesome. So now the piece has been cut, it has been bent, and now it has to find its way back to the cart again, the bumper it belongs with. And these guys, some of them will split up and even share on carts because they, like the laser operators, just get experience at this and so they know different setups and how much tooling, and so there's different parts that are easier for different guys. They can combine or they all have the equal tooling that they would need to do it all by themselves, any one of these cars. We've got the tooling at every station. But they tend to get efficient by just banging them out together. Now, as they've migrated through, now you have a complete bumper, ready to go. I mean, just look at the complexity on a cart like this. This is just all the pieces to make a matrix bumper, just like are on the Sloth Tacoma over there. It's crazy how this starts, and now it's gotta get into assembly to convert this from a pile of pieces into the beginnings of a bumper. So I used to not really like to bring people through the plant because I didn't want to divulge too many of our competitive advantages. But then I realized, you know what? It's worth it. For the slight chance that somebody could make any sense of how this works, you can't just do it by copying what you see. It has to be deeply ingrained in the culture and the engineering and the design process, the focus on standards, the duplications of equipment, there's a lot of CapEx, so that's no longer a risk. I'd much rather be able to show this to our customers so they can appreciate the origins of their parts. Now this is, what do you start with? Basically a, a blank fixture table, and depending on the complexity of the part, like most of our black steel lines have pretty complex fixtures, a lot of these will be self-fixturing through tab and slot and just the overall construction where you clamp it, what you hold, how you put them together. And these guys, they're all pros. I mean, we're working with an all-star group right now on the tail end. So off the assembly table, you now have a bumper. Basically, the entire thing's ready to go. It's already been checked at its intolerance. You've got the right width, left to right, and it's time for weld before it goes into grind. So look at this steaming hot beauty right now. It's get smoked a bug on there. We call this the big bead. It's a signature weld that only Fab Fours does and only on our black steel line. The reason for that in the gloss black, an actual pretty weld just gets masked over. You can't see it. Whereas this kind of over embellished, oversized, by the time you powder it in gloss black, it looks like the stack of dimes you wanted to see. So this ain't easy. I can throw down most of the welds in this building, but a big bead still intimidates me. Let me back up. You know what makes a really good part? Go to a show, look real closely at a bumper, and I guarantee you're gonna find all sorts of porosity and BBs. It all starts in engineering. You have to have the right equipment with the right designs to keep those tolerance tight. Because if you have a good seam, you're then gonna get a good weld. If you get a good weld, then you get a good grind. It all begets each other. So we have the combination of all that experience in engineering combined with what are now $4,000 Pulse MIG welding machines at every station. The combination, you hear that sound? That's the difference between Pulse and traditional MIG. And it is the optimal weld to be ground away. We're gonna get full penetration, but it's really, you want just enough so that you can make your crisp steam, but not too much that you're just cutting down welds all day using energy. So then you come into this artistic skill of finishing, which is taking all these welds and you gotta first cut them down, which we normally use the big nine inch, it's a heavy grinder, but with a big pad so you can get a flat surface. Then after you've cut those, it's a combination of DA, slap disc, and other to knock them down. You can see he's doing that right now with a bigger disc. And the bigger that is, the flatter the surface. We don't want any waviness in a finished seam. 
In fact, we want it to be hard to discern between what was done on the press brake and what was done with weld and grind. So the evolution of a seam, see how crisp that is? It's just a sharp knife edge. That's how you want to start. And then you got to round it over a little bit because the press brake is a little rounded. But if this was wavy at all, it'd be a dead giveaway that that was a welded seam and we don't want that. So after we've done all of our finishing to get all the seams just right, the final step is actually called two Mary and final weld. That's because with those artistic welds, we don't even want to accidentally bump them in the manufacturing process. So they're left to the final step. And then we're going to throw down those beads that you just want to get envious of. Rodney just started like 10 years ago. Guy's an old champ. So Brandy just pushed another bumper over. So the QC's coming through where she's gonna check for any BBs. Final inspection over the overall dimensions. Just make sure it's ready to go. Cause literally at this point, if a customer had bought it in bare steel, it'd be ready to go get packaged. But that probably represents less than 5% easy. Most products are going powder coated. In fact, even for paint match, which I love, we actually prefer that customers start with our powder coat. And any painter is totally capable of scuffing the exterior and painting over it, yet that gives you all of the robust strength of powder on all the internals. Paint is line of sight, so you're only going to be able to paint what you can see, and there's a lot of nooks and crannies inside of bracketry you can't. Powder coat, on the other hand, is a charged system. Positive charge out of the gun, negative on the rail, so that cloud of powder is going to find its way into all the nooks and crannies. Then you're going to get it baked. That's the best rust prevention you can have. So do that where it matters, inside, and paint the outside to look sweet on your rig. All right, so you can see the difference in these two rows of products. Those are going into the blast room. These have been out of the blast room. So it's taking all of the anise splatter, any of the sort of mill scale that might be left on the steel, any little BBs, some of the sharp edges, and they're gonna blast that away using the steel shot. This is now a prep surface for powder coat, and you want that optimal kind of surface. I forget their actual word for it, but it's gonna make to where the powder can best cling to it. Surface profile, I think it's called. So the blast, what's cool now is we've got the, the augered floor, so it's on a conveyor system. All you have to do is dump the media into it, and it's automatically going over and being funneled all the way up to the ceiling to replenish the hopper. And these guys can just blast and blast. It's a tough job, but it's one of the most important in getting a good powder coat done. So you might notice all through this plant, if you're into manufacturing that everywhere you look, there's two of everything. Not one place do you find an important piece of equipment with one of them. And that is redundancy. We've got to have that because if anything fails, given our manufacturing model, the sausage making stops right there. Everything downstream eats, and you've got a gap, you've got to replenish. We need constant flow. So if any piece of the major equipment goes down, we can just redeploy the resources over to the remaining machine, overstaff it, and mostly limp along while we have maintenance to bring it back up. Well, that goes even for the powder system. These guys thought I was absolutely nuts to basically build two identical powder coating operations inside of each other because what we were sizing it for was twice our current capacity, and then we were getting two systems. So four times the capacity we needed, but this is a big thing to put in and not something you wanna do often. So if you're wondering, this is what a $1.5 million powder coating system looks like. Two top coat boosts, two infrared pre-gel ovens, two convection ovens. So all this first part is manually pulled through because Again, we're a single piece flow. We're gonna build what's sold. And so one trolley to the next has different amounts of work on it. So to make sure that the operator has all the time he needs to properly powder coat it, this had to stay manual. Now when it goes into the convection oven, that's just time. It needs 45 minutes to cure no matter what's on the trolley. So it is automated and the overhead conveyor will actually pull it through. So we walk right on through here, watch your step. 
And see, he just pulled out what was a primered cure. So this infrared system is hot, trust me. And the winter is pretty nice back here. Now it's starting to heat up. This is like this all day open. But what you get then is a, you let that primer gel. It's not to a full cure, but it is gelled enough to where, unlike fresh powder, you can't blow it off anymore. And there is an optimal temperature to a part to shoot the top coat. So he's gonna actually let it sit there for a little while to cool down because it's too hot right now. But you can see how it's got a little bit of shine to it. And that means it's just right for going into top coat. So the reason I have so many boosts is to not have to do changeovers. We can keep just the right powders in the hoppers and just let the parts keep flowing, whatever color they need to be. In this particular case, see it says primer only. These are actually going over to the Middle East and they are gonna be custom painted tan for military applications. So it's not usual for us to do primer only through the oven, but that's actually the finished product for the customer. And he, what he did is he just loaded it far enough to where now this vanilla colored rail will pick up this trolley and index it through about one foot per minute. And that will net you a 45 minute cure So these are also going in. If I wipe that right now, I could take all the powder coat off and you have to redo it. But as soon as it hits this infrared bank, which is one bank of IRs, it'll start that cure process so that we don't have to worry about the turbulence of the ovens in there. Because there's a lot of hot air moving inside. Come on back, you see where they're born. So this right here is my favorite spot in the entire plant. I'm like the guy in Jurassic Park that likes to hatch every egg. This is when the bumper is born. For the first time, it is officially what the customer is going to get when it comes out of this rail. It is a cured part. The powder coat is done. There's no more value to be added to it besides putting it in a box. So it's a really cool place to come inspect all the quality, tip to tail, craftsmanship, BBs, everything, including the powder coat can be done right here. So it's pretty cool, but they are still 400 degrees, so you gotta give it a little time to cool off. Again, yeah, you'll see the diversity, the fact that we can have a flat black here, a primer there, a shiny gloss on our ranch bumpers. Having that ability for quick change is critical for the type of manufacturing flow that we have. These are all done. So these are actually indexing right now. I'd have to just hold still and we'd have to be patient and you'd see this slowly drift away from me. But it really only looks good on time lapse and you can see these things kind of wiggling their way down. And if packaging outstrips it, you can always move forward on the rail. You just can't really go backwards without setting those, hitting the dogs. So this is a little bit of an unsung hero, which is packaging. It's actually a very critical piece. When the products enter the oven, they obviously cannot go with their traveler, which is their workflow instructions. Well, that means the product is separated from the data, and now you have to realign those. Look, there's a big risk that a Dodge bumper gets forward brackets if you don't take the proper care. And what we say is there's, if you do that, there's an evil twin. Somewhere there's a Ford bumper with Dodge brackets. Not good. Whenever that happens, inevitably, it's already been paint matched, the truck's on the lift, the customer's leaving that weekend. Yeah, it's not good. So we take extra care to make sure that packaging is done just right. And you want to smash through gates, hit it, deer on your commute, doesn't matter. But when you get that bumper, it's got to be perfect when it comes out of the gates. No scratches, no damage. So it's critical that we develop custom packaging unique to every product to have it just right. You know, you're gonna think this is overkill and shops, they start piling up these tri-wall cardboards. It's like hard to even throw them away. But it's funny, after all these years, you're going to shops and you'll see our green foam on the floor often because the guys like to lay on them. They like to put other parts on them. But a lot of these packaging materials are so robust, they end up taking on extra lives in the future. Now, it's done. It's just waiting on its friends. 
So basically every order that's going to come through, it's rare that there's a bumper. You know, in our situation, most time it's a full truckload, a 53 footer that's going to have between 40 and 60 items on it. So given the nature of the manufacturing you saw flowing through, now they all have to accumulate. And once they do, we're going to shrink wrap each pile to look like that and load 13 skids deep on a semi and boom, it's out of here. Heading to distribution centers nationwide, ready for you to walk into your local four wheel drive shop, line X shop, say, hey, I need a rear for my Tacoma. You know, wife backed it into a bollard at Target. Tomorrow, I don't care where you are, if you're seeing this and you're in the lower 48, maybe even Alaska, you get that bumper next day. That's a real piece of the Fab Four's value proposition. Quality on time. And this is the end of the road. Basically, it's gonna hand it into that dark box. We're gonna close the doors. It's gonna arrive at one of these DCs around the country. They're gonna take it off with their care because they own it. And then they're gonna deliver it in their van to the shop you bought it from. So it's been handled all the way from here such that you end up pulling up, either pick it up, take it home, or let them put the install in. That's sometimes kind of nice to just let them work it out. Tip to tail, flat steel over there, into the box here. That is the journey of the bumper. All right, so that about wraps it up for this facility tour. I had an absolute blast going around, seeing how everybody was working, seeing how things are made in America. It was truly inspiring. If you guys want to see a video about Greg and his entrepreneurial story, make sure to click up here. And if you guys want to see a build walk around this truck behind me, then make sure to click up here. Don't forget to like this video. If you haven't already subscribed, make sure to do so. And I'll see you guys in the next video.